What is going on, everybody? And welcome to the Thursday edition of the Stochastic NHL Strategy Show. I'm your host, Josh Harris. I see my internet's off to a great start. But um, yeah, a lovely day in New Jersey here. A little rainy, uh, a little irs -y. But joining me, as always, Slim Cliffy, what's going on? Oh, not a whole lot, man. Um, getting kind of the same weather as you, overcast, rain on and off today. So hasn't been quite as nice as the last few days. Uh, interesting <laughs> night of games last night. The Blues pretty much ended that game in about seven minutes against Chicago, up 4 nothing after four shots on goal. Uh, Edmonton, they're up 3 nothing halfway through the second, Cruz to a 5-1 win. So I was watching Edmonton in Vegas, so I think, catch much of that Vancouver Arizona game but gets announced that that Arizona is almost likely going to be relo relocated to Salt Lake City this summer and then Diller Genter goes out and has has his first four point game of his career while Logan Cooley has a goal and assist like I've said like it feels like Arizona is turning like really turned the corner I know like they haven't had a good season or whatever they just need to build out that blue line it's going to suck when that team, like if that team actually turns into like a perennial playoff team two years down the road or something, because you, you can easily see that happen with, with all the talent that they have. And especially if their defensemen pan out. Yeah. And Utah's a really nice spot for hockey, but like, I don't know. Gary Bettman said that they're going to try to expand to 36 teams by 2030. It's like, you well, can't even feel 32. Yeah. That, that was the rumor. I've seen from a couple of reporters, like there's been nothing of substance. I, I, it seems pretty likely we're going to get at least two more teams, which like every year there are two or three teams that are absolutely awful. If not outright tanking, that's just going to get worse with more teams. Uh, like I, anyways, we don't have the time, nor do I really feel like arguing about Gary Bettman's location plans for the coyotes. Cause we've been doing that for 20 years now. Yeah, I mean, maybe if you pay the water bills, you know, you wouldn't you'd still be in Arizona. But anyway, just want to go give a quick shout out to Yellowbird, who takes down the hip check seemingly every night. He won again last night, his 11th takedown on the season. It's insane, uh, for especially for the hip check. That one's harder to win than most tournaments, even though it's just a one dollar buy in. Congrats to you. Let me know who you're going to play tonight so I can play them and, uh, you know, cash for the first time since the Reagan administration. Yeah, I feel like if we get like a Yellowbird top three stacks plus a Frostback goalie to stack against, like we can cross reference that and make a pretty good DFS tool. Yeah, I, he's been busy this week, Frostback. He's, I don't know, I don't know what, I don't, I don't understand why your priorities wouldn't be the Discord with your goalie picks, but, you know, help us out, brother. Anyway, uh, let's get into the slate. We got 10 games. Should probably do that. Before we do, just want to say thank you for the affiliate link signups, the super chats, and all that stuff. I will have an MMA video out hopefully tonight for UFC 300. We do have a UFC deal. I will mention that in my video, uh, and it will down, be down below. The link will be below uh, my video on Twitter, but this is one of the biggest UFC cards ever. This might be their best card ever. And, uh, yeah, we've already agreed on the Salt Lake City Soakers. It's a done deal. Jake's on the board of governors. So it's definitely going to be the Salt Lake City Soakers. Can't wait. Nice little splash emoji as they're in your jersey. And it's just, you know, it's a good. You have a goalie cheat that works out typically. Would you like to share with the class? But anyway, let's get let's get into the slate here. Washington Capitals with a 2.7 total heading into Buffalo. The Skinny Swords have a 2.9 total. This game sucks. <laughs> right out the gate, this game sucks. Um, I don't like the Washington Lines at all. I wanted them to be Stromo Vechkin anybody. They aren't. Uh, it kind of takes me out on Washington. I think an Ovechkin one off perfectly good. Strom one off perfectly acceptable. Strom Ovechkin two man, even though they're on different lines, they do scale on the same power point. But I think it's fine. It's just these lines are just miserable. 
the interesting part is Buffalo won. And it's what do you do with them? Because they're coming in at 11.4% projected ownership at 18,200 with a 14.5% top two stack. This is the most bipolar team in the NHL. You just don't know what Buffalo Sabres team you're going to get. This line has been very good. They have been very high event on both ends of the ice. Uh, Very good offensive, very good defensively. They are fully correlated, correlated on the power play. So... I do like them. I just don't know if I'm going to get there with a 2.9 home total. That's it's out. It's the lowest home total on the slate. So I, I don't think I want to spend double digit ownership in the lowest home total on the slate. When you have Florida on the slate with a 4.1 Tampa Bay with a 3.7 Toronto with a 3.7, the Kings with a 3.4, a bunch of 3.5s. You know what I mean? So I think they're fine in MME. It's just that, it's a little bit high on the ownership for me in that total. So Buffalo one is my favorite line in this game. You want to go to Buffalo two as a filler. If you're doing some expensive power play stuff, I think that's fine. But Buffalo one, Vetchkin one off, but I don't particularly love this game. Yeah, see, like, <laughs> trust me, I get what you're saying about the lowest home total. Like, you never really want to stack the lowest home total on a 10-game slate. Like, there are plenty of options to turn to. This is the problem that I'm kind of running into is one, like that Buffalo top line has actually been like really good together. Um, I wrote about Tage Thompson in the picks article today with JJ Paterka on the left wing, 41.4 shots, three expected goals, 5.7 actual goals per 60 minutes at five on five and 125 minutes together. Um, like I'm a, I've been, I'm a huge JJ Paterka fan. Like you and I have been since last season. He's, he doesn't have a ton of assists, but he has an outside shot at 30 goals, and he actually has good playmaking numbers. It's just he's typically been playing on the second and third lines, and with Jack Quinn injured most of the year, there wasn't a lot of scoring on the second and third lines when you had Tuck or Skinner on the top line, right? So, I'm not really, and Dylan Cousins just hasn't had a great year, so I'm not really blaming Paterka's lack of assists on him. Um, I think he's just a, like truly one of the best under 20, what is he? 21. I think he's one of the best under 22, like offensive players that there is in the league and they're perfectly correlated and they're not expensive. Like that's kind of what's getting to me is like, these guys have been getting a lot of ice time of late. That's another thing that I mentioned. Um, Tage Thompson's, uh, skated at least 18 and a half minutes in eight of his last 10 games averaging 1943 per game in that span. Like this is a guy that was playing 16 and 17 minutes for long stretches this season. They were playing well. They're getting rewarded with ice time. They're perfectly correlated on the power play. And yes, it's a 2.9 total, but I think that says more about the rest of the team than it necessarily does about uh, that top line Um, because they have been really good. The rest of the team hasn't. I think that's kind of what's going on here. I still really like the Sabres. Yes, there is double-digit ownership coming in on them, 11.4%, but at 14.5% top two stack, even with that low total, I really do like the Buffalo top line here. Um, You know, the Washington penalty kill has not been very good for a while now. Uh, Over the last six six weeks, they're bottom five by shots against per 60 on the PK. Uh, They're not taking a ton of penalties. That's kind of saving them, but the penalty kill itself has not been very good. Not that Buffalo's power play has actually been that good, like almost at all this year, but it is a good matchup for them. So I still do like Buffalo one. They are a line that I am considering in single entry on the Washington side though. I agree with you. I don't have any interest in that top line. Oshie and Ovechkin just haven't really done anything this year. They have a 240 minute sample, which is about a quarter of the season. Like we're talking about 20 plus games of ice time together. 2.2 2.2 expected goals, 2.3 actual goals per 60 minutes. There's just nothing there. Now, Stroman Wilson is kind of interesting because they actually do have good numbers together without Ovechkin. And, you know, protest is protest. 12,600 going against, you know, Buffalo's second and third lines that certainly aren't great defensively. I think there's a case to be made for Strom Wilson and protest, especially where Stroman Wilson are on the quote top power play unit. So you can get two out of three guys in depth matchups from the Sabres. Um, Buffalo penalty kill has been okay, but not great. I think there's merit to that second line from the Caps. 
but I think that'd be something I'd be more interested in if I had like a 20 max or 150 in a single entry. I don't think I'm going to get there. It'd be more one off Ovechkin or nothing else. So I think it's Buffalo one. I like best in this game for sure. Yeah. I, you know, I get it with Buffalo one. Um, I just, I don't, I think the way I'm going tonight, I will not be playing them, but I get if you do. For, uh, Columbus Blue Jackets with a 2.3 total heading into Florida. The Panthers have a 4.1 total. Um, Alex Nylander is a game-time decision. If he's out, it will be Justin Danforth on the top line with Vronkoff and Johnny, Johnny Gaudreau. Top line, that's 10,600. I don't really have any interest in Columbus here. The one thing I will say is Florida takes an absolute insane, insane amount of penalties. That top line is fully correlated. If you need it as a filler in your MME and it gets in, I think it's fine. Florida is where my interest lies. I like Florida one here. They're coming in with an 18.4% top two stack, 15.6% projected ownership at 19.4%. They're not as high event as I wanted them to be, but that Columbus top line is absolutely putrid defensively, whether it's Nylander, whether it's Danforth. And they're fully correlated, and Columbus's penalty kill sucks. So, like, I am perfectly fine with Florida one here. They should be able to push the pace just because Columbus top line is so bad defensively. Uh, you get all the guys on the power play. This is a good power play spot. You have a little bit of positive leverage. They're less projected ownership than the Florida second line, which doesn't make sense to me. I understand it's a price discrepancy thing, but we slandered Nick Cousins the other day and he scored, but I, I'm fine with a Mackachuk one off for adding him into your Florida one stack, but I, I'm in on Florida one here. It's my favorite line in this game. Not so much in on Florida two. Kachuk one off is fine. Columbus won in MME if you need a filler, but you know, this is a Florida game. Yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of interest in Columbus. So I won't go long here. Um, I, I'm cut, I just agree with you. Like if you're playing 20 max or, or higher or something like that, and, and you happen to get a Columbus one in there, I think that's fine, but their power play hasn't been good. So even if Florida d- get, does give them like four power plays, like Florida could kill all those off pretty easily, I think, against a pretty hapless uh, power play from Columbus. So not a lot of interest in the Jackets. It is about the Florida side for me. Um, yeah, that Florida top line has been low event. We brought that up on the show on Tuesday, how they weren't as bad defensively as we were expecting with Vladimir Tarasenko up there. But it's also kind of crushed their offense. Like, um, they're at 57 shot attempts per 60 minutes at five on five with Tarasenko on the top line. That is a really, really, really low number for them. Um, Just for, like, basically any Florida line in general. Uh, But about 57 shot attempts per 60 minutes at five on five is... 20 shot attempts lower than the top line um, with Carter Verhage there. The expected goals against worse, the actual goals for were, or the expected goals for worse, the actual goals for are worse. Um, I think, you know, again, what we mentioned on Tuesday, part of it is they know he's bad defensively, so they can't really push the pace as much as they want with other players that might be up there, whether it be Verhage or Evan Rodriguez or, or whatever. So they can't take as many chances. All that said, <laughs> this is still a great matchup for Florida one. Like I wrote them up in the picks article for a reason, uh, still free to read by the way, uh, for the rest of the season, Saturday, Tuesday, and Thursday next week, I think, um, ending we'll see. Uh, but that Florida top line is leading the top, stacks uh, in top two stack percentage they're under 20k total it's driving a lot of ownership their way but you know what i mentioned in 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 the article is columbus is dead last dead last by expected goals against per 60 minutes at five on five over the last six weeks like they have just been absolutely dreadful 
at five on five. And the penalty kill honestly hasn't been that much better. Fourth most shots against per 60 minutes uh, on the PK over the last six weeks. So like, it's just a great matchup all over the place. There is a lot of ownership on them, 15.6%. But it's 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 one of those, like, it's it's almost too hard to pass up. You know what I mean? Like, even if that comes up to, like, 20%, I'd be fine playing that line at 20% in a single entry. It's just that good of a matchup, especially where they have a 4.1 total. Um, I really do like Florida here. A lot of people will really like Florida here. Um I think, I think if you want to turn into a power play stack because the stack itself is cheap enough as it is, like if you want to just add Mac and Chuck and make it a four forward stack, I think that's perfectly fine. But I really do like Florida one, Florida two. I'm not really sold on them for this reason. Is I'm kind of worried about ice time. Mac Kachuk hasn't skated 20 minutes in a game in 12 straight in eight straight games. Sorry, like. It's, it seems like they learned their lesson from the playoffs last year that you need to be healthy if you really want to win the Stanley Cup. Like, you can't have multiple players nursing major injuries and try to win a Stanley Cup. Like, they did well enough to get to the final as it was. Um, so I'm worried that they're going to slack back um, his ice time. You know, we saw E2 lose to Reinen, jump up to the second line uh, towards the end of the game for Florida on Tuesday as well. So I'm not sold on Nick Cousins staying there all game either. Yeah, I think a Kachuk one-off is fine, but I'd almost rather use him as part of a power play stack in case Florida really does go nuts because it is such a good power play matchup for them. So Florida one is really the only line I have interest in in this game. We are on the same page there. Detroit Red Wings with a 2.9 total. Heading into Pittsburgh, the Penguins have a 3.5. This is a big game for the East wild card. Um I mean, one of these teams really needs to win in regulation, and one of the team, and they need Washington to lose in regulation. Three point games off the board incoming, but this is an interesting matchup. Detroit going with Larkin, DeBrincat, Raymond, Kane, Confer, Perron. Status quo for Pittsburgh. Anytime Larkin and DeBrincat are together, I would have some interest. And they're going to get that Crosby matchup. And with Drew O'Connor there, they're pretty high event. I don't think at 7.2% projected ownership, I'm going to make them a single entry priority. But at 16,100, they are circled for me for my sing like to cut down in single entry. I don't really have a ton of interest in Detroit too with Kane Confer Perron, despite the ownership share projected at 6.9%. As nice as that is, I don't like that line. So Detroit won definitely in play for me in single entry. I don't know if I'm going to get there, but they're in consideration. Pittsburgh, I have more interest in. And I think there are two definitely playable lines and it depends on what price point you want to get to. Crosby, Russ, Drew O'Connor, at 19,100, 4.1% projected ownership, I think. That is an interesting pivot away from Florida 1. It's an interesting pivot from Buffalo ownership as, as well. They are pretty high event. You've talked ad nauseum about how good Crosby and Rust have been all season, whether it's Gensel or not there. So I, I do like Pittsburgh 1 here if you're spending up. But Pittsburgh 2 is more interesting to me at 13,000. They do have some negative leverage at 7.4% projected with a 3.6% top two stack, but they have been excellent together. Malkin, Bunting, and Raquel. They're going to get a Comfer, Perron, Kane line, which is just miserable. Like, I don't care what the numbers are. They're wrong. They're worse. <laughs> like, they're, that line is just not going to be very good defensively. Malkin, Bunting, Raquel have a very, very good sample together offensively. Their expected goals is outpacing their their, uh, excuse me, their actual goals is outpacing their expected goals, but their expected goals is still really, really high. I, I really like Pit 2 as a filler. They're, if you can't afford Pit 1, I'm perfectly fine with Pittsburgh 2. This is a good power play matchup. You get two guys on both of the top two lines. So I, I like Pittsburgh here, and it kind of sucks because Pittsburgh sucks. <laughs> I, I appreciate your commitment to just hating the Penguins. Um <laughs> Yeah, it, I'll start on the Pittsburgh side because I did write up Michael Bunting in in the article today. Like, just quickly, 
I know there's been people throwing out like Sidney Crosby for Hart Trophy because of what he's done over the last month, basically, since they traded, actually, since Jake Gensel got hurt back in February, basically. But this team isn't in the position that they're in if Malkin and, and if Malkin and Bunting don't do what they've done over the last 10 games. Like Malkin has something like 12 points in his last 10 games. Um, I wrote about Tyler Bunting, or uh, Tyler Bunting, Michael Bunting, uh, in the picks article today, he's got 13 points in his last 15 games. Like that was a big problem for Cro- for Pittsburgh basically from December on was the secondary scoring wasn't there. They finally started to get it and they're winning hockey games. Like that's kind of what's happened here. Um, the Pittsburgh top line, as you mentioned, has been really good uh, with Drew O'Connor and, and Brian Russ there. 3.7 expected goals, 3.9 actual goals per 60 minutes of five on five. Like, Drew O'Connor, in his last 15 games, he's averaging two and a half shots per game. Like, this isn't just some third wheel that doesn't do anything. He's got nine points and two and a half shots per game uh, since the trade deadline. So, he's been really, really productive. Um, I don't mind Pittsburgh one, obviously. 19,100, perfectly acceptable uh, with positive leverage. You know, the team total is good at three and a half Detroit is not <laughs> as a team um so I yeah I do like pit one the thing is is I kind of agree with you on pit two like I wrote up Michael Bunting him and Malkin have been really really good together 36 shots 3.7 expected goals 5.4 actual goals per 60 minutes of five on five and they're gonna go into that middle of the Detroit lineup and man, Patrick Kane and David Perron will not be good defensive wickers for JT Comfort. Uh, that line's going to be atrocious. They're going to get run over. I mean, I was I was looking at Comfort and Perron together this season. 230 minutes, which is, again, nearly a quarter of a season, especially for a second-line winger. 47 shot attempts for 67 against per 60 minutes at 5-on-5. Five five. Two expected goals for three against and yes they are getting outscored um 3.2 to 2.9 like this is not going to be a good defensive line whatsoever um I, yes they are coming in with negative leverage at 7.4 percent i don't think that that's that big of an issue um if you're playing a line one of the 20k ish lines and you need a, some sort of a cheap filler so I, yeah i do like the pittsburgh top six in its entirety i think pit one is perfectly fine to play i think i'm kind of with you like the way it's looking, I might make my lineups here tonight. I think I might need a cheap 13K, 12K filler, or something like that. So, I, yes, I do like pit two going in, into the middle of that Detroit lineup. Um, on the Detroit side, it's only the top line that I have interest in. Uh, yeah, DeBrincat, Raymond, and Larkin have been good together this year. 2.6 expected goals, 4.1 actual goals per 60. The interesting thing about them, like greatly outscoring their expected goals is Lucas Raymond has legitimately taken another step as a player this year. He, his first two years in the league, he was very much a passenger along, you know, largely alongside um, Dylan Larkin. He hasn't played a ton. Like, yes, he has played with Larkin a fair bit this year, but not as much as in previous seasons. And it's because they've been able to use him on different lines to help get the offense going elsewhere. Like this is a guy that has, that could reach 30 goals with a little hot streak here towards the end of the season. Already has a career high 64 points. I was looking at some of the underlying stats like Raymond is making a lot of plays from the middle of the ice. Like he's attacking the middle and then looking for, and then kind of drawing the opposition to him and then finding guys in space out wide. And it's, I think it's creating really high percentage shots for his teammates. And when you have Alex to bring and, and Dylan Larkin as, as line mates, that's a good thing. So yes, I really do like Detroit one here. There are a bunch of lines in that price range I do like today, though. Like in that 15 to 18K range, there are like probably five or six lines that I think are somewhat interchangeable. So it's not like, oh, you, you got to run out and play Detroit. I think there are a lot of other spots. But for that price, yes, I do like Detroit one. I, I do like Pitt one. I just think for the way I'm personally building here today, I would have a lot more interest in Pitt two. Yeah. I, I think. If you're thinking about Buffalo one and you're worried about ownership, which you shouldn't do, but if you are, I think pit one is an interesting, uh, you know, contrarian option in, in that price range. But I, I, I somehow like pit two more. 
Philadelphia Flyers with a 2.6 total heading into Madison Square Garden. The Rangers have a 3.5. Flyers are just tanking. And it's interesting because, like, I kind of – I saw a bunch of Flyers beat writers arguing about what is happening, and none of them brought any stats to the table. They were just yelling into the void. So I kind of went and looked, and, like, their play hasn't really fallen off from a defensive standpoint since Carter Hart left. It's the goalies are just dog shit is essentially what's happening. So like, that's why you see Tortorella mixing and matching all these lines. But like, if your goalie isn't going to stop the shots, it doesn't matter what combo you're going to get. Yeah. The power play or the penalty kill has, you know, slid a little bit, but that's also goaltending related. They don't have a goalie that has played well. So, you know, it is what it is. And now we have no idea what the the lines are going to be because instead of watching practice, why they ran lines, every single reporter went to talk to Torts because he's a good quote. You know what I mean? So we don't know what the Flyers lines are going to be. As Cliffy says, it's kind of a blessing in disguise because now we don't have to pretend we like the Flyers. I'm still fine with the tip at one off. I'm still fine with the connecting one off. You know what I mean? Like those guys are just, you know, their best players, and you can play them in in this matchup. My interest lies on the Rangers' side here. I know the Rangers' second line is expensive, and Aaron Chorchek off here. They're up to 21-3. It was literally like 10 days ago. They're like 18-1. It's fine. I still think this is a good matchup because their goalie sucks. It doesn't matter if it's Urson. doesn't matter if it's – I forget the, the guy's name. I apologize, but – I, I like the Rangers' second line. They're coming in with 2.5% projected ownership, and that's another reason why I'm a little bit drawn to them. I, I don't particularly love spending up for the Rangers, especially at 21-3, but it would be for this line. Uh, Panarin's having an unbelievable season. Lafreniere's having a good season. Trocek's been great since Hedl has gone out. I think spending 21-3 is fine at that ownership. They have a 13.2% top two stack, 2.5% projected ownership, so they have a ton of positive leverage. I'm fine with the the Rangers top line. I do worry that I know Zvanajad is playing tonight. He left hurt last game. Kreider left hurt last game. Rosovic only played 11 minutes despite that. They're trying to get, you know, that third line, like Wenberg played almost 17 minutes. Kako and Cooley both played more than Rosovic. So it's kind of baked into the price at 16-4. And I think it's fine, but I, I'd much prefer Rangers second line here. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go long on the Flyers here. I went back and watched the sequence of all nine Montreal goals uh, from Tuesday night, which honestly, still, Montreal scoring nine goals is absolutely incredible. Uh, the first goal against was a deflection in front. The second goal against was one of the funniest goals against I've seen this season as Jamie Drysdale shadows Cole Caulfield up to the top of the circle and then Yuri Slavkovsky's left wide open front because two, two Flyers uh, forwards chase Nick Suzuki. And Drysdale's pointing to Slavkovsky. And then he looks around and he realizes, like, oh, shit, I'm the guy that's supposed to cover him. And then it's in the net. Uh, goal three was another deflection. Goal four was a breakaway. Goal five was Josh Anderson crashing into the goalie. Goal six was straight up. 2019 Edmonton Oilers defending like three to de- three defenders clumped within five feet of each other in the middle of the ice goal seven Scott Lawton passed it directly to somebody's uh the tape of somebody's stick in the defensive zone uh goal eight was a breakaway and goal nine was a two on one like there weren't a lot where I would say this was the goalie's fault you know what it really reminded me of was watching the Ottawa Senators play hockey it reminded me of defenseman just making the stupidest decisions imaginable at every possible turn. Um, yes, the metrics still look good. and I'd have to go back and watch all the goals against over the last couple of months to really know for sure. I'm going to guess that trading Sean Walker was a real bad idea because they were only creating offense with him on the ice. They really aren't, or at least haven't been creating a ton of offense with Cam York, you know, Travis Sanheim, Igor Zamula, like, 
they're all the team is below average offensively with all of those guys on the ice. The only ones they haven't been below average offensively with are Sean Walker, Sean Walker's defense partner, and funny enough, Mark Stahl. I honestly don't know why. Um, I just think that we I've seen a lot of quotes of how the Flyers have been playing really stupid. And when I watch back all those goals from Montreal, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. All that said, I have no interest in the Flyers. Like you said, we don't know what the lines are, so how can we possibly recommend which lines to play? If you want to play some one-offs, connect me, tip it, all that stuff, I think that's fine. I don't have a ton of interest in Philly. On the Rangers side, I'm worried about the top line. And I know you say Panarin's the top line now, so I'll say the second line. The Zibanejad, Kreider, Rosovic line. Because we saw Kreider and, Roz- and Zibanejad kind of get dinged up in that last game. Uh, Mika left for a few shifts and then came back. They look fine for tonight, but Jack Rosovic was just a healthy scratch. They benched they benched him after Kreider and Mika got hurt. He didn't get a lot of ice time. Like I don't know if these guys are gonna. Can we even rely on Kreider and Zibanejad playing 18 minutes here tonight? That's kind of the problem I'm running into. I think I'd rather just play the Rangers second line. I'd rather just go play Panarin, Trocheck, and Lafreniere. We know they're gonna get their ice time as long as they're healthy. We know how good that they've been all season long. Yes, they're expensive but there's also going to be very little ownership on them. Um, there aren't a ton of high price lines. So it's basically play this or, you know, maybe like Tampa Bay or, you know, Florida's just under 20 K, but like there aren't a hot, ton of high price lines. It's basically the, just this Rangers line. And I really do like this matchup. You mentioned the penalty kill. Yeah. The Flyers have been on a big penalty kill slide of late. This was a team that was like top three, top five by almost every penalty killing metric for like 40 games. Uh, that has certainly not been the case of late. They are 22nd by shots against per 60 minutes on the penalty kill over the last six weeks, 31st by goals against. This is a bad penalty kill. We know how good the Rangers' power play is. I really like Panarin, Chocek, and Lafreniere here tonight. Same. Um, it's rare when Cliffy really likes the Rangers' lines. Back... Back in the day, what was it? Um, I forget the website. But I remember my, my first biggest win ever. You recommended the Broussard line. I was like, this guy hates the Rangers. So I'm going to play them if he's going to write them off. And they were optimal. Well, the rest is you. history. Now we're here. Yeah. Um, Ottawa Senators with a 2.9 total. Heading into Tampa, the Lightning have a 3.7. I believe Duclair's out. Um, well, they said he's, he's very doubtful. I don't think they're going to push it. So, yeah, it looks like Connor, top line Connor Sheary. Yeah. Sweet. Like, I would imagine Connor Sheary plays 12 minutes, kind of like how Duclair was playing 12 minutes. I think Kucherov and Point, completely fine here. You want to add in Sheary and hope he donks an assist? Like, that's fine. Like, the Sens are just a garbage organization. Like, there's no other way to put it. Like, they should have let Deadpool buy the team, and it would have been fine. But, no. I, I'm fine with Nikita Kucherov, Point, and Shiri. If you're going to play Duclair there for 13 minutes, you can play Shiri there for 12 minutes or whatever he plays. I think you can add in Stamkos, make it a power play stack. I think you can add in Nick Paul, make it a power play stack, depending on your price tolerance. So you do what you do there. Again, that second line, 16-2, I'd rather play Detroit 1. They just haven't been great this season. I think Stamkos is a fine one-off. You Maybe they get there. But again, over the long haul, I've been fading this line and it's been profitable. On the Ottawa side, I'm not running out to play Kachuk, Pinto, Batherson in single entry. They ha- they're – Top two stack is double their ownership, so that always gives me some interest. It's more of an MME thing for me. Um, you know, Vasilevsky's actually been playing well of late. Um, it is what it is. I think they're fine in MME. I'm not running out to play them in single entry. It's Tampa one for me. Yeah, I was I, I, on Tuesday show. I was thinking like maybe this was going to be a sneaking auto, sneaky Ottawa night, and then they got shut out two nothing. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, well, yeah, I don't have a. Yeah, it is Tompkins. That is, you are right. 
Um, I don't have a ton of interest in in the Ottawa top line. Like 2.8 expected goals, 2.2 actual goals per 60 minutes of five on five over the last two months and change. <laughs> They're not doing anything offensively. And the Tampa Bay penalty kill has actually been really, really good of late. Now, part of it is Vasilevsky. Yes, he has been absolutely insane. So whether Tompkins can do that, we'll see. Um, but Tampa Bay is allowing the ninth fewest shot attempts uh, per minute on the penalty uh, on the penalty kill over the last six weeks. Like this is a team that had struggled on the penalty kill at times, and they're really not giving up much. Um, I don't really like this power play spot for Ottawa, even though Tampa Bay is taking 3.7 minor penalties per game over the last six weeks, league average about 3.3. So, you know, they're well above that. And Ottawa is drawing power plays. I think, you know, because there's not much ownership coming in on them, just 6%, I'm fine playing the Sens top line in like 20 max. Like if it was, if I was 20 maxing tonight, I'd probably have at least one, if not two of that Ottawa top line in a single entry. I'd honestly, I'll just go pay the extra two thousand dollars and go play the flock and go play the Rangers. Like that's just kind of the way that I look at it. Um, not a lot of interest in the Greg Giroux line uh, for me. It's more about the Tampa side here. The thing with Connor Sheary is like he's not like I don't. I'm like I'm not going to slag the guy. It's not he's not a great DFS player. Like obviously, um, I think his value more specifically comes from the defensive side of the puck. But he's twenty five hundred, right? It, it assists with two shots, and that's great value at tw from 2,500 on DK. So uh, I really do like Tampa 1. What worries me is that they do use them against other top lines, and whatever we want to say about Ottawa, that top line has been good defensively. Um, 2.3 expected goals against, 2.2 actual goals against per 60 minutes at 5-on-5. Five five. Like, that is really good defensive numbers. They'd have to get a lot done on the penalty kill, uh, or on the power play, sorry, Tampa would. But they can do that because the Ottawa penalty kill has not been that great. We know how good the Tampa power play is. Tampa 1 is firmly in play for me. I think it's another case where, like, I'd, I'd probably just go play the Rangers against the Flyers instead. You know what I mean? Um, I do think Tampa 2 is in play here. That Stamkos Hagel Sorelli line. One, Stamkos has just been on an unbelievable tear uh, for like a month now. The other is, the line has actually played reasonably well since the all-star break, like break even by expected goals for and against, um, which is perfectly fine, but they're going against that Ottawa um, Greg Giroux line. Greg and Giroux don't have good numbers together this season at all without Brady Kachuk on the wing. I think that line can be had defensively and you still get uh Stamkos on the top power play unit. I don't mind Tampa two as one of those 16 K ish lines here. Uh, but it is Tampa one that I like best in this game. And it's just the Tampa side in general. I'd rather play here and even be fine with a power play stack. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. I like, a power. I mean, like if you don't like Shiri, he's been priced, but you know, Nick Paul can't be that much more expensive. You know what I mean? If you want to fit in Stamkos, get a little wild. It's, it's basically your price tolerance. New Jersey devils with a 2.8 total heading into Toronto. The Maple Leafs have a 3.7. This is a spicy game. Looks like Graham Clark going to be on the top line with Nico Heischer and Jesper Bratt. We don't know. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Yeah, here's the thing. Nico Heischer and Jesper Bratt, very high event both ways. And Toronto 1 has been absolute nitrous offensively. Like, just ridiculous. And they're 18-5. Coming in with 10.1% top two stack, 9% projected ownership. They're not fully correlated on the power play, but this is a pretty poopers power play matchup. I really, really like Toronto one here. Um, their their numbers are insane, and Nico Heischer and Brat, long sample, multiple years, they've been always high event. You throw whomever up there with them. It, I don't think there's a guy. That can, you know, stabilize them. A winger, anyway. Like, you throw Timo up there, it's not going to help defensively. You throw Mercer up there, it's not going to help defensively. I, I, like, Palat would help, but they're not going to put him up there. So, I'm very much in on Toronto 1. You want to play Toronto 2, like, that's fine. 
like their numbers actually have been pretty decent offensively anyway defensively a little shockingly bad but um i'm more in on toronto one here uh, it's it's my favorite line on toronto by a mile on the devil's side i think there is some merit to go into he sure brat just because the matthews bertuzzi domi line is so high event like it, both those lines are high event it's just going to be pond hockey uh I th- but i do think matthews is going to be able to control the play there for the most part but at 5.5% projected ownership at 15,800 or whatever it is, I don't think you need a full stock. I think you just go Heesha Brat and call it a day. Like, I think that's fine. I think Timo's an interesting one off going into that second line. But, you know, this is a Toronto one game for me. Yeah. The one thing that worries me is like, since they've gone to these line configurations with Nylander on the third line and Bertuzzi Domi on the top line, Matthews isn't getting shut down minutes anymore. Um, I just looked at the game against Pittsburgh. Over 80% of his even strength ice time was not against Sidney Crosby. So I'm thinking Matthews is probably going to go up against the second and third lines. The thing is, is like those lines are very good defensively. (laughs) It's just like it doesn't really matter that much. Um, And yeah, that Toronto top line has just been absolutely absurd. Like I wrote them up. In the picks article today, we recommended him on the show on Tuesday. 45.3 shots, 4.7 expected goals, and 6.9 actual goals per 60 minutes in like 125 minutes together, I think it is. Um, that is patently absurd. You know what it reminds me of is the Hisher Brat Platt line from like two months ago. <laughs> that line was just killing everybody almost every single night. And the reason I particularly like Toronto 1 here. You know, not only do they get middle six matchups against against New Jersey, and like this New Jersey team just doesn't have anything in the middle of the roster, um, you know, between their injuries up front and on the blue line. But New Jersey still has maintained a good penalty kill, right? And Matthews is the only guy on that top power or on the top line that's on the top power play unit. But it's not a particularly good power play matchup for them. So like, yeah, maybe they get one power play goal, but I'm not that worried about, you know, Toronto going absolutely ham. Uh, on New Jersey's penalty kill here tonight. So I'd rather focus on a great five-on-five matchup, and that means focusing on Toronto 1. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you. I do like Toronto 1 here tonight. It's not a ton of ownership coming in on them, 9%, 10% uh, top two stack, so a little bit of positive leverage. They're not getting as much ice time, which is a little bit of a concern. It seems like they are starting to rest players a little bit um, as they march towards the playoffs and they spread out the ice time across three lines, but... This is still a really good matchup for the Toronto top line. I really like Toronto one. If you want to dip down to Toronto two, I think that's okay. I I still have a problem playing any Toronto stack and leaving Austin Matthews off, especially when he's like, this guy's trying to get 70 goals, like seven zero goals on the season. Leaving him off the stack just kind of feels bad. So Toronto one for me on the New Jersey side, I honestly don't have that much interest in that New Jersey top line because of that that Tavares Marner line has been good defensively, as you mentioned, um, 2.6 expected goals against the goals, the actual goals against are higher uh, without William Nylander on the line. But I think that's just kind of a small sample issue. Like uh, it's just not a great matchup for New Jersey and without Jack Hughes, like we went through this back in January, like the New Jersey pe- power plays really not that good without him. Um so it's Meyer, Hall, and Mercer that I actually have a little bit of more interest in because, like, Mercer and Hall actually have good numbers together this season. 3.2 expected goals for 2.7 against per 60 minutes. They're basically priced as a filler line, and you get two out of the three guys on the top power play unit. Um, I like New Jersey, too, better on the, on the New Jersey side, uh, especially with the way I'm building my lineups. But it's Toronto 1 I like best in this game. Yeah, same. Um, can't believe I might have to play Toronto or Pittsburgh tonight. It's just an actual scene. But anyway, Montreal Canadiens at a 2.5 total heading into Long Island. That's just miserable. The Islanders have a 3.5 total. I like, do I want to play the Islanders top line here? No. Are they in a very good matchup? Yes. 
Are they fully correlated? Yes. Is the price good? Yes. They're 16-1, fully correlated, 10.4% projected ownership, 8% top two stack, a little bit of negative leverage. I'm fine with them at that price. They're circled for single entry. Will I get there personally? Probably not. I think they're fine. It's a very good power play matchup, despite what you may think about Casey Sezekis. It's just like they're just not good. <laughs> That's like the, the problem I'm running into them with. Like their numbers just aren't good, but it's such a good matchup. It's kind of like the Florida one. It's like they're like Walmart Florida one right now. Um, they are high event, but like they aren't controlling the play as good as I thought they would be. But like they're going to see new hook Gallagher Armia, you know what I mean? And that line just isn't great defensively. So like I'm fine with them. I think I prefer Montreal one to the Islanders top line here. Yeah, it's a 2.5 total, but it's a top-heavy total. You know where it's going to come from. Caulfield, Suzuki, Slavkovsky, and they're going to face off against, you know, Pajot, Engvall, and Lee, and that line is whatever. They're fully correlated. Islanders' penalty kill has been a problem all season. Doesn't matter the coach. Doesn't matter the personnel. They've been bad all season. They're 17-2, 6.2% top two stack, 2.6% projected ownership. I really like Montreal one. I'm fine with the Islanders top line. But I think if I was going to play a line in this game, it would be the Montreal top line. Yeah, I'll just say, uh, like, just in general, I don't have a lot of interest in this game on either side. Um, the main reason is, like, yes, the Islanders penalty kill is bad. Montreal power play, honestly, has not been that good since they traded Sean Monaghan. Like, league average-ish. A little bit less than that, actually, which is not not great. And the Islanders aren't taking any penalties at all. Like, that's one thing that they've weirdly done under Patrick Watt is stop taking penalties. They're at 2.15 minor penalties taken per game over the last six weeks. There's no team below 2.6. And the league average, again, is about 3.3. They're taking 1.2 minor penalties fewer than the league average per game like that is absolutely nuts and Montreal gets one power play or zero power plays it's not enough for this for a team that's not that efficient with the man advantage to really take advantage of it and I don't think it's that great of a matchup at five on five like I'm not a big JG Pajot guy but Lee and Engvall are both effective defensive wingers right and I don't think it's a good matchup for them at five on five like because there's no ownership 2.6%. Two point six percent. I think they're perfectly fine to play. I like. I, I won't say no to a Cole Caulfield one off or something like that because he does shoot so much. I think like Caulfield's at um, three point eight shots per game over his last twenty games. Um, like he doesn't need two goals and an assist to reach DFS value. I just don't think the whole line is going to get there. So I'm kind of out on Montreal, and I don't have a lot of interest in the Islanders. Like, if anything, it would be that Islanders top line. It would be Horvat, Barzal, and Sezikis. Small sample. They've been good enough offensively. Three expected goals per 60 minutes in their 55 minutes together. 10.4% um, ownership, as you mentioned, at that 16,100 mark. But the thing is, is there are a lot of lines in that price range today, right? We're going to talk about Los Angeles later. We already talked about Detroit. I mentioned Tampa Bay. Um you know, Buffalo is, you know, $2,000 more expensive. So they're a little bit out of range, but, you know, we'll get to Winnipeg in a second. There are some depth Dallas lines. Like, I think there are just other spots I would rather go to than Islanders one. I think they're fine. But honestly, I just don't have a lot of interest in either side. Yeah. I'm glad because, like, I don't really want to play Islanders at 10%. Like, any reason not to, I won't. Mm -hmm. Winnipeg Jets with a 2.5 total heading into Dallas. The Stars have a three total. Looks like Winnipeg going back to Connor, Shifley, Vlardy, Ehlers, Monaghan, Toffoli. Um, not the game for it. <laughs> the 
this game isn't a game for it really. Like there's no line with over 0.9% projected ownership and it's the Dallas top line, which I don't really have interest in despite it being probably the best matchup on the board in this game. I, I don't have a ton of interest there. Like they just don't play enough for the price when you can get um, Wyatt Johnson, Ben and Stankov in a 15, three for similar minutes. It's not a great matchup for them either. I don't think I'm going to full stack anything on either side. I think a Wyatt Johnson one-off is fine. I think, um, you know, a, like a Duchesne one-off is fine. Like I'm not looking to full stack either side of this game. I am so mad that Kyle Connor's back on the top line. I, like this is one of those situations where I wonder – what does the coach see that we don't, right? I can't speak on it because I trashed that coach in the worst possible times. Yeah, that's true. You probably shouldn't. But, okay, 600 minutes at five on five for Shifley and Connor without Nikolai Ehlers next to them. Goal share under 47%. Expected goal share under 42%. Nikolai Ehlers on the ice without those guys, 560 minutes, goal share over 62%, expected goal share over 53%. Like he's crushing it. And Shifley and Ehlers are absolutely murdering the opposition without Kyle Connor on the wing. Uh, 260 minutes without Kyle Connor, three and a half expected goals, 4.1 actual goals, 72% of the actual goal share. Like I honestly don't know why this would happen. Like I, I mean, I get why, because they, they haven't been winning a ton of games. Um, you know, four-game win streak, but lost six games before that. But that's the thing. They're on a four-game win streak. Why are you throwing that away? Like, I just – it's just so frustrating. I have no interest in Winnipeg here tonight. One-offs, short. You know, Healers one-off, Connor one-off, whatever. I just, This is a bad matchup. Dallas has been legit – like, just monstrous defensively since they got Chris Tanev. We keep saying it. They have two fantastic defense pairs, both offensively, particularly defensively. And with Jake Ondra playing the way he has, uh, just no on Winnipeg. On the Dallas side, here's the thing. That Winnipeg top line sucks defensively. Um, it's not just expected goals against, which are really bad at 3.9 expected goals against. Like, what? They are getting scored on, too, at 4.4 goals against per 60 minutes. And we know the penalty kill is bad as well. I haven't been playing that much Dallas top line this season. I don't really plan on playing the Dallas top line either. Um, like, if I'm going to play a line above 18K where I can't really fit two of them in unless I'm double punting defensemen, I'm just paying up to go play Rangers or Tampa Bay. But I do think if I'm 20 maxing or 150 maxing, there should be some interest in that Dallas top line. They have, you want to talk about turnarounds. 3.3 expected goals for one and a half against since they got Chris Tana. 3.1 actual goals for one and a half against in actual terms. Like they have been dominant at five on five and they're perfectly correlated on the power play and the Jets have a bad penalty kill. They're not going to play a lot of minutes. They're going to play 16, 17 minutes. That's the problem. And that's why I'm not playing them in single entry, but in 20 max or 150 or something, I would have a little bit of interest in Dallas one. Other than that, I don't have a lot of interest in this game. Yeah. I really wanted to get behind Dallas one here. It's just like, it's just a minutes thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anywhere near 20 minutes. This would have been an unbelievable spot, sneaky spot, but they're going to play 16 minutes, 17 minutes, 18 if we're lucky. So, yeah. Let's talk about the Sharks. Yeah. San Jose Sharks with a 2.2 total heading into Seattle. The Kraken have a 3.3. .3. Did you see anything on Jared McCann while we were on the show, or he, we, he's just a game-time decision? Um, you go ahead. I'll go double check on that. Yeah. Let me spew some garbage about the sharks for a minute here. They suck. I don't have a ton of interest. Seattle's good defensively. They have a good penalty kill. I'd rather just play pit two than San Jose one. Uh, on the Seattle side, every single one of the Seattle lines is cheap. They're coming in with a little bit of negative leverage, but nothing egregious. 
it's just a question if McCann is in, then we might not know what the lines are going to be. Seattle's not very good about reporting that kind of stuff either until pregame. So I don't know if we're going to get news. I don't think it will affect the Shane Wright line. Yeah, we're we're not going to get any news. Yeah. He was on the ice, and they said that Dave Haxtell is not talking until before the game, which will be, what, 8 o'clock Eastern, something like that. So, yeah, too bad. I'm not super enthusiastic about full stacking Seattle anyway. I think like a Shane Wright one-off is in play. If you need a cheap center, Bjorkstrand, you know, Tolvanen, like the guys that shoot are interesting to me. Um, If McCann's in and you have a one-off spot in his price range, I think that is a very, very spicy one-off. You're going to get him low-owned. Um, but like this game sucks and it sucks a maximum amount of ass. So like, I'm fine with some Seattle one-offs. I have no interest in the sharks. Yeah. I, the thing about Jeremy can is he's 6,400 on DK, right? There's a problem. <laughs> yeah. He's 2,200 more expensive. He's 2,200 more expensive than the next closest, uh, Seattle center. And he's 1,600 more than the next closest Seattle forward. So, like, you could be end up leaving a lot of salary on the table if he doesn't play. If he does play, I suspect he takes Andre Burakovsky's spot. And then Burakovsky either goes to the third or fourth line. But Jeremy Kim was playing a little bit in the top six, or has been over the last month, or the bottom six, sorry, over the last month. So that's, like, not a guarantee. Like, the only line I feel like is – uh, surely going to stay together for warmups. Um, if McCann is back in, you're right. Is that uh, Schwartz Everly Shane Wright line? I wrote up Shane Wright in the picks article. I mean, he's getting 16 minutes with high shot rates and, and a limited sample so far. Uh, you know, Schwartz and, and Everly actually have good offensive generation this year. I looked at their numbers without Jared McCann, who has been the team's best center pretty much offensively anyway. Uh, 3.3 expected goals, 68 shot attempts per 60 minutes without Jeremy McCann. So, like, Shane Wright stepping into a pretty good spot. And, obviously, it's the San Jose Sharks. Like, this team is unbelievably bad. There's not a lot of ownership either. 4.7%, uh, 11,400. I think they're perfectly fine um, to play here tonight, especially if you need them with an expensive Rangers, expensive Tampa Bay, something like that. I'm not running out to stack Seattle. Like, I'm not building around the Seattle Kraken here tonight. And I pro- I, I do have interest in one-offs. Like, I, you're right. Like, Jeremy Cann makes a really good one-off at 6,400. Um, if he doesn't play, like, there aren't a lot of guys in the next game that uh, you can swap to. Like, maybe Victor Arvidsson. Like, that's about it. But um, I do have interest in that right line as one of the cheap stacks. Because, like, San Jose is just, like, they're unbelievably bad. I don't know what else to explain it. And the thing is, is the top line is even worse with William Eklund there. Like they just haven't meshed well with Eklund. They get a ton of minutes. That's why they produce somewhat. But um, with Eklund there, they're at 1.9 expected goals for 3.2 against. 49 shot attempts for 66 against per 60 minutes. Like they're just bad. And I, you know, Wright's probably going to go up against the second line. But man, the second line has got a, a college kid. Luke Cunning and Clean Costin, like, yeah, I'm not worried about that either. So, uh, I like the Shane Wright line in this game. No interest in San Jose. It's just a bad matchup for him. If you want to play San Jose one, because they're probably going to play a lot of minutes, that's fine. But Seattle has a decent penalty kill, doesn't take penalties, and that's where San Jose's value comes from. So, none for me. Yeah. Yeah. Calgary Flames, <laughs> two point six total. Heading into Los Angeles, the Kings, Los Reyes, have a 3.4 total. Calgary sucks. Um, I don't have much interest, if any, on the flame side. This is just a brutal matchup. Um, Not to mention and, Blake, Blake Coleman's out, they said. Yeah. So we Pickles don't... is out. We, we don't know exactly what the line combinations are going to be. I'm assuming Kadri Kuzmenko Apostle stays together. I don't know what the rest of the lines are going to be. 
Yeah. I mean, maybe Mangiapane goes up with Backlund and Cherengo, which we just don't know. It doesn't really matter. I have no interest in Calgary here tonight. My interest is on the LA side. I think LA1 is fine at 16,000, 4.3% top two stack, 3.7% projected ownership. The one thing that worries me was Byfield's ice time last game. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if it was a like a one-off thing or what. That does worry me. I do like LA2 better anyway. Over $300 less, same top two stack, 3.8% projected ownership. Arvidsson Moore, Deneau. You know, they've always been good when they play together. No exception here. They're going to get God knows what on Calgary. Calgary's penalty kill hasn't been great. They kind of split the power play time. I, I do like Arvidsson more to know here. I think uh, LA3 is fine as a filler if you need a filler there, if you're going expensive. So I think there's three playable lines. My favorite is LA2. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Don't have a lot of interest in Calgary. Like the the Calgary line is fine, I guess, but the thing is, like, there are just other filler lines I'd rather go play. Um, like we just talked about Seattle, I'd rather go play Seattle, even if the ownership is is much much higher. So um, that's just kind of the issue on the King side. I wrote up Kempe in the picks article. I didn't realize how much ice time that they were getting. Um, Kempe's been skating pretty much like 19 minutes, if not more, 20 minutes, 21 minutes at times. Um, so he's getting a lot of, uh, of ice time this season. Um, Kempe, Byfield, Kopitar, only two out of three on the top power play. Calgary's been taking a lot of, uh, not a lot of penalties, but an above average rate of penalties. But the Kings haven't been drawing a lot of power plays, so I'm not as worried about the power play correlation. And Kings 2 has just been really, really good um, since Arvidsson got there. Like, they've been good for years. But with Arvidsson there this season, 74 shot attempts, 3.6 expected goals, 4.6 actual goals per 60 minutes. And they're probably going to go up against the Kadri line. Maybe not. I mean, I guess we'll see what the what the Calgary lineup looks like. It matters. Yeah, I don't think it matters that much either. And they've just been generating so much offense. They're they are another one of those like you know fifteen to eighteen k lines that I really do like here tonight. So Kings two for me, but I think Kings one is certainly in play as well. Yeah, interesting game. And by interesting, we have to stay awake to watch the Sharks and the Flames. Coming up after us at six p.m. Eastern NBA Live for Lock with Josh and. Eric, 7 p.m. to play back live watch along stream. So if you're playing NBA, stay tuned for that. Let's talk about some defensemen here. Yay, defensemen. Adam Fox, highest price defenseman on the slate. I think there is some merit to it. It's a very good power play spot. He plays a ton of minutes. I'm okay with it. The top range, I don't particularly love the top range. Um, it would probably be Fox and then Wierenski just because Florida takes a ton of penalties and Wierenski's peripherals have been good. But other than that, like I don't particularly love the top range. Um, yeah, I am not huge on the expensive guys here tonight, but a lot of them are projecting well. Um, Victor Hedman, obviously in a pretty good home matchup. Uh, Rasmus Dahlin, like I do really do like Buffalo here tonight. And with Bowen Byram out, like Dolan, Dolan might have to get even more ice time, uh, which is always uh, nice because of his peripherals. I think Zach Wierenski's okay, but it's really Hedman and Dolan that I'm, I'm looking towards here tonight. Uh, amongst the expensive defensemen, yes, Adam Fox obviously in play. Everybody's in play. It's flyers the way that cold tending's going right now. Mid price range, like, uh, yes, obviously Brandon Montour for Florida at home, especially with Ekblad out, you know, Gustav Forsling as well. Wrote up Ryan Pulak. Like, he's getting 24 to 25 minutes a game um, as the number one defenseman for the Islanders. And this is a really good matchup at home for them. Um, I don't mind Pulak for 4,100 on DK. I wrote up more at Cedar as well. Like, that matchup against Pittsburgh is a pretty good matchup for him to rack up those peripherals, the shots and blocks, uh, particularly on DraftKings. He, he's projecting very well. And it's a, it should be a high-paced matchup against the Penguins. I like uh cedar in that mid price range for cheaper guys like owen power because byron's out Byron, he's gonna have to get more ice time adam pellick for the islanders he's getting 20 to 21 minutes at home in a good matchup uh, marcus Pedersen, kind of the same thing 
Matt Roy, anytime he's under 4K, I always have interest in Matt Roy. So uh, I do like Matt Roy. Going back to the Justin Schultz, uh, well, I think is perfectly fine because Vince Dunn is not playing here tonight. Brendan Smith's been getting like 21 minutes of his time for the New Jersey Devils. I don't really want to play him, but he is in play just because of the ice time and uh, not a bad matchup to rack up some peripherals. Also think it's not a bad night for really cheap guys. Like, again, with Byram out, the top guys from the Sabres defense are going to be playing more. So Henry Yokoharu, 2,700, I think makes sense. Uh, Henry Thrun has been getting like 21 minutes a game for the Sharks. He might have to throw his body in front of some pucks here tonight. He's only 2,700. Uh, and again, Simon Edvinson, he's not producing a lot yet, but he keeps getting 19 to 20 minutes a game on average. And he's stone mint price in what's not a bad matchup against the Penguins. So if you need a stone mint defenseman, I don't mind Edvinson. I've been playing some Edvinson. Eventually, he's going to get a bonus. <laughs> Let's talk about some goalies. Christ. I want to talk about goalies. Um, no one in the top range really excites me. If I was going to spend up, it would probably be Joey Decord, but like shot volume concerns there. Bob, shot volume concerns there. Jake Ottinger at 7,900 would probably be my spend up option. Uh, I like Uka Pekka Lukanen. I just like saying that name I, I i like both goalies in that game actually like charlie lingren for the same reasons you like buffalo one and probably the same reasons why you play lingren if washington's going to make the playoffs it has nothing to do with their offense it's going to be charlie lingren that's going to carry them <sighs> for a punt like i think you go back to jet greaves uh it doesn't feel great you can just play Montembeau for two hundred dollars more, but there are two goalies under seven K, and you always have to consider them when they get the shot volume. So, I prefer Greaves to Cooley. Yeah, sucks that Johnny Quick's getting the start because I really did like this spot for Igor, um, even at eighty two hundred. Like I think Bobrovsky would be my expensive goalie of choice, just because Columbus can generate shots and their power play is so bad. Like I'm not worried about them going like two for four on the power play or anything like that. So. I think Bob's fine if you have the room to spend up, but I'm definitely not targeting him. Uh, Cam Talbot at home against Calgary. Like, I'm not worried about uh, – like, if – this feels like famous last words. I can't imagine Calgary piles up, like, five goals here tonight. Um, the Kings have just been tremendous defensively. Um, don't mind Talbot. You know, I had Shesterkin, but I think Bobrovsky is the expensive guy. Alex Lyon – on the road against Pittsburgh, like Pittsburgh's power play is still not that great. And Detroit does give up a lot of shots. So he could get a lot of shots at five on five, which I think is what you want when you're facing the Penguins. Don't mind lying in that mid price range, like him and Charlie Lindgren, basically one, two in that 74 to 7,700 range for cheap guys. It's, it's, um, it's definitely Montembeau. Like I'm, the Islanders, the Islanders' penalty power play has just really been bad. That's why they've made all the significant changes that they've had, and Montreal really only gets in trouble um, when they start taking a lot of penalties, which they have been. But as long as they don't, especially with Jack Eye and Gouli out, I think Montembeau can be fine here tonight for pretty cheap. Yeah, and, like, the Islanders' power play units are just atrocious. So, you know, gives a little boost to Montreal there, just a tiny one. But who are you liking for your hat trick pick? Back to back Slavkovsky? No. <laughs> uh, I'm going to Pittsburgh. I put him up in the article. Got to shout him out. I'm going Mikey Bunting. Mikey Bunting. I do like that. Going week to week to two. Victor Arvidsson. That was from Star Trek. I didn't know you were a Trekkie. Oh. My parents are hippies, my friend. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I guess, it, like, Older people of a certain generation really have an affinity for it. Like, I definitely have family members that are big Trekkies. Um, you know, I watched The Next Generation when I was younger, just never really kept up with it. I didn't get that reference at all. You're going to have to put that one in the back pocket. It's from the, the the new the new one, the new old one, the original with Chris Pine. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are good movies, too. I do like them, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> don't want to go off on a Star Trek tangent. Um, hey, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We'll be back uh, Saturday, assuming there's more than seven dollars to win uh, in the GPPs, and uh, 
We'll see you then. Good luck, everybody. And uh, win some money. Good luck tonight, everybody.